So let's go to our topics. A short introduction to ENISA. Uh, we were founded in 2005. Uh, it was just a period when the European Union was enlarged from 15 uh, to 25 member states. Um, there was a time that the economy was really running well. We had the Olympic Games in Greece, so there was a lot of uh, forex at that time. Um, and it was something, if you looked at our sector IT, the IT security, if you look for the internet, it's just around 15 years. So we're talking uh, about a short period. And I think the good message behind this, if you talk about ENISA IT security, is something that the politicians over the past years took responsibility. They have more awareness. If you go back five years ago, not really everyone on the political level talked about IT security. But if you look now into the cyber security strategy and into this directive, it shows that you have different areas from internal security of minds, from digital agenda of crews, from affairs. Uh, from Ashton, which shows that the people are discussing this and putting together as a big picture for Europe. So we are basically doing two things. We are looking into certain topics, technologies, threats, that's something what we are really thinking into the future, and then supporting member states and the Commission for the legislative processes. The second part that really support member states. We go into the member states. We help them to build up computer emergency response teams, so if they have questions in the legislation. So this is really, for us, operational work to support to increase IT security level. And here I want to give you some kind of example. Of course, when we go to member states, just a picture that a lot of our staff is on a lot of missions. We try to cover uh, every part of Europe. So this one in Dublin is the newest one today. So this shows that we really go to the member states to support them. Of course, most of the things we are doing in uh, Brussels. Um, what changed if you look back um, into the past? If you look into this online world, it's something where on one hand a generation challenge, because if you look back and if you had parents and children, the parents told the children how to drive a bicycle. And today it's a lot of cases the other way around. You have social networks, but the question really is, does it change the behavior of our society? Because we treat different today, our privacy life, our privacy data, we open it. So the question is now how to deal in this area with IT security. We have industry which now depends on IT security processes, uh, which depends on IT, of course. You have governments who depend on IT. You have supply chain in the IT. So it's something, if you look, this that we say our society depends on IT. And the question is also, when we say a lot of people are online, what is about the digital divide for those who are not participating in this area? But if you're talking about those who depend on IT, it's something that the question is, uh, what is the responsibility of a government, of a state, for their economy and for their citizen? And this is some of the basic background, if you look at ENISA, that you say we are a common market agency. If you look into our scope of the regulation, we want to increase IT security for governments, for the business area and for the citizen. And this is something which comes out of this. Um, if you look at this, some parts were mentioned, I think it's something where the question is how to make this world safer, because not everyone thinks about it from the first step. If you look, for example, all of you have smartphones, how much security is a smartphone? It's the same like a PC a couple of years ago, where also IT security was an add-on. So the question is here that we say, we have this kind of devices, we have critical infrastructure, but the question is, everyone hopes that a nuclear power plant is not connected to the internet. So there are certain things where we say, where have we really systems which have to be secured in another way? So it's something where the world changes, the risks changes, and um, which is something if you talk about cyber attacks, it's something that shifted over the last 20 years. 
there was a so-called ethical hacker to show I can attack the system. And then there was on the screen, I got it. But today it's something where we have criminals who earn money. In some cases you can earn money, more money in the cyber criminal space than you deal with drugs. It's much more easier for you. You sit somewhere on your PC, you have a command control server, and then it's remote cyber criminals. So this is something where the world changes. And if you look into this, it's something what I said about this 15 years. We started you know, with computer viruses, phishing. Uh, if you look at phishing, it also shows that human behavior unfortunately doesn't change. In the past, somebody went with a pistol to a bank. Today it's phishing, it's also getting money from your bank account. But there's one difference. If you have your money in a bank, and it's a robbery with a pistol, your money is uh, by an insurance uh, secure. Today you have to talk to your bank, let's say someone give back your money because they attack your own bank account. If you look for spying, it's the same as in the past. <laughs> the tools change. And it's much more easier with drawing horses, spam emails, and it's also that the social aspect is still the same. You try to build up trust with somebody, and then you open attachments, uh, you have drawing horses on your PC. Botnets, it's remote control of PCs. We have the critical infrastructures, you know about Stuxnet, the attack on uranium, uh, uranium nuclear power plant. And the second, you know, on the, the, the far right is cloud computing is in the business model. And the question is here, will we see attacks on cloud computing? So if you look from this, the answer is, why should be there no attacks? Yeah? So the question is then, uh, how do we prevent ourselves? How can we do the best that the damage is uh, not so high and that we can secure our assets? Um, this is a typical report of ENISA. We published it last year. It's a so-called threat landscape report. The challenge, if you talk about threats, what threats do we have? And then if you ask yourself from a, let's say, business perspective or government perspective, the question is, how can I manage this? And the question is always, uh, uh, this is the principle, you cannot manage what you don't measure. So we need information. The problem from the past is if you look into reports, they are either from industry, companies or sectors. I wouldn't say it's always in the interest, but you cannot say that the report uh, is neutral if it's from an industry company which works in this place. Uh, there are only a few reports on member states level. Germany published every two years a uh, landscape <coughs> threat analysis, and uh, there's one in the UK, there's one in the US with the FBI. But what we try to do here is for the first time to make a threat landscape report for Europe and take into account everything what is available and put it in a global picture. So our intention is uh, to do this now uh, every year. So if you look into this, I think uh, it gives some ideas what we are doing. Um, the challenge, of course, is if you are an agency on European level, we don't want to duplicate what is done on the national level. Uh, on the other hand, you have bigger member states which have an IT industry, which are doing a lot of uh, things in the cyberspace, they have a cyber strategy, uh, they have national plans, they have public-private partnerships with the industry. So, uh, well, of course you can name Germany, France, Great Britain, uh, but if you look at it, it's more the northern member states who are more advanced in the IT security area. So the question is from European perspective, we have new member states, as I mentioned at the beginning, since 2005. Uh, we have now Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, and others. So the question is how to have a um, maximum of high IT security level in Europe, and how can we achieve this, how we can we support other member states. So the weakest link in a chain, you know, is always the one who uh, we have to support. 
And this is something where if you look into ambitions, a lot of effort is to support them and to cooperate. So if you talk about protecting and critical infrastructure, it's areas where we have uh, energy, uh, when you now look into the new energy discussion where you have smart grids, digital smart meters uh, for electricity in households. This is something where the question is always where is the government responsible for? So we are talking about public infrastructure of the government, we are talking about electricity, uh, IT providers. Uh, we can also talk about the banking sector, you know, from the finance crisis, from the banking sector. And if tomorrow every ATM machine in uh, Ireland is off, the question is what happens? Is there panic or something else? So the question is in some areas that we say we have critical infrastructures, and this is where we have to work together with the uh, people who run this critical infrastructure. If you took into the strategy, is what it was mentioned. Um, in the strategy, I will give also some examples later. But the basic idea is to say what is a common approach, I mentioned of Cruz, Ashton, and Masters, to improve this. So we will invest more in the research area, we will look for certification. And I think the positive message from the strategy is that it also puts the agencies together on the European level. If you look at the end of the strategy paper, there's a nice picture which shows that it's going from the prevention of uh, IT security like EMISA does. You have then Europol as a member state with the prosecution area, you have the defense area, the European Defense Agency. So it covers uh, a whole picture and it puts together for the first time all the different agencies in their cooperation from the different uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, assisting operational communities, this uh, <coughs> covers, for example, the Article 13a of the Telecommunication Directive, where incidents, data breaches are notified to the national regulators and then to EMISA. So this gives us a lot of information and data in the future, what happens on the member states level. The important message here is, it's something where we get anonymized and aggregated data, and the question is then, what has to be done on the government level, what can be improved together with industry. It's important to say it's not to blame anyone or to say this is something which is used for benchmarking on European level. This is not our intention. Our intention is really to say we need some information. Um, what is the situation? Um, security data, which notification, assisting operational communities, no security privacy, something where we also involved supporting the Commission in the discussion about the new privacy directive, which is published by a uh, commissioner already. Um, important point is that we have to exist. <coughs> Imagine you are running a big company, you have a big IT department, you should test and try to pull the plug and see what happens. Does your recovery system work? You know, sometimes you have this alarm and then uh, everyone has to leave his office and go down the street and test if the emergency evacuation, evacuation works. Yeah? The same you have to do for IT. And if you remember, we had in 2007 the attack on Estonia. And this also was a discussion, what shall we do on national level? What shall we do on cooperation? Level and so what was decided that we have this exercise in the European level. So we did it uh, the first time in 2010. This was a tabletop exercise where we were sitting together. Well, you can look at it like a war room in our essence office. Uh, we invited member states, simulated incidents, interruptions of uh, uh, internet connections and see how we can help, uh, how we can communicate. So the basic objective of 2010 was to test communication, escalation, to see who is responsible in the member states. And if you look back in 2010, we also made a report on this interesting things in a lot of cases, it was not defined who is responsible in the member state for what. So if I phone somebody, is there somebody who can make a decision? or escalated to a minister or to a secretary of state. 2011 was a tabletop exercise together with the United States. So um, 
it was a time when there was a discussion about WikiLeaks, uh, other attacks. So what we try to do there in the picture to take some of the ongoing known attacks and see if there's a possibility to help over the Atlantic to exchange information. So it was something where we also learned how does it work in the US, what are best practices, can we take over. And then last year we made uh, an exercise again together with the member states, <coughs> but we also included the private sector. So we had more than 120 companies from the, the uh, providers, from the internet service providers, from the banking sector, basically this telecommunication banking sector. It was something where we also interact with the industry to see how is it working there, what are the challenges and how can we learn from this also in the area to improve it. We will now continue. This is a picture here of uh, the office in essence where the table, the different uh, players from the member states are sitting. So it's something like you sit in front of your PC, it simulates your office in the member state, and suddenly you get a message there and saying uh, your country is off the internet. And then the question what do you do? Panic. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not panic. I think what we now have is so-called standard operational procedures uh, where we know how is your communication, whom to call, and whom to ask about. I think this is the most important thing and also we include the uh, computer emergency response to um, scenery. Uh, if you look into the details and the slides will be available, uh, we are also proud that we got a lot of uh, press release, media awareness, that was something where it was picked up was not just him. I think we got a lot of positive comments. Let's say it's not only for any, it's also for the community, the member states, everyone who was involved in this exercise really appreciated it. Um, just two examples what is typically for our work. work. Um, if you look into cloud computing, it's the new business model. Um, what we are trying to do is to put the emphasis on security service level agreements, because when you normally have a service level agreement, you don't have something about IP security in there. So the question is, it includes privacy, how do you deal with your privacy data, other things. So it's something where we give some recommendations. If you go into the cloud, that I would say you know what you're doing. We also distinguish between government and cloud, because when you're a government and want to use cloud computing services, you don't want the bare outside the European jurisdiction, in some cases the government you want to have your own country because you might have different legislation even in different member states in Europe. And uh, so this is something which is then the, the government cloud. The private cloud is a little bit what was in the past outsourcing, but a scalable outsourcing where you say, I have it somewhere but I'm not in control. So for the industry it could mean I go to a European provider and I know it stays in Europe, or you say I'm a big company and I want to make a special contract. The problem with cloud computing is that we as a normal user, if we go to a cloud computing service or a social network or something else, we cannot discuss the terms and conditions. But a government can do it, the commission can do it, a big company can do it, and this is a chance if a company is going to a cloud that they can adjust the terms of reference and uh, SMEs. Well, smart grid security is something where we start <coughs> to put security in it. The question is still, what is IT security by design? And if you take a picture, if you have your electricity meter in your household, in the basement, for example, it's built by a company which does it in an analog way. Now in the future you make it in a digital way and you put computer capabilities, you put storage in there. And the question is, do these companies who build smart meters have the knowledge about IT security? So if somebody sees this video, they would say, ah, of course we have it. Yeah? But the question is something which you, what you learn from other sectors. If you look, for example, if you have cars, you put a lot of IT now in. If you have uh, wireless LAN networks, the question is how do you secure your wireless LAN? 
If you put a smart meter on the internet, the question is how do you secure it? It's not just transformation of information. The question is to think about, is it secured against attacks? Against outside attacks, internal manipulation? And if you think further, the intention of these smart grids, electricity grids, is that we have an intelligent electricity grid where you can put in solar energy, where you can optimize the consumption, where you can put the electricity in an optimized way through this infrastructure. And then the question is, if you rely on this infrastructure, who thinks about IT security, that it's not uh, sabotage, hacking, denial of service attack, etc. I think this is something what we try to put into the beginning when we are involved in this discussion. Strategies. There are different approaches. Um, some member states say we start with the national security, then we have different aspects, civil, military, and then IT security is somewhat part of it. Other member states look at more from the perspective and say, this is our infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, we put IT security in. If you go through the member states, it's different ministries who deal with this. If you look just at a television uh, magazine, if there's something about the financial crisis, you see financial minister. If there's something with a scandal with meat, you have the minister at every state, you know. For Commissioner Cruz, it's a little bit more difficult because in some country it's the Ministry for Interior, in another country it's the Ministry of Transport, in another country it's the Ministry of Economy. And then you see that it's evolved over the years. And what now the question is, uh, and what the Commission and we are asking for is, uh, write a cyber strategy, write an IT strategy, have a governance structure in a member state, and the question is then in the end, who is the chief information officer of Ireland? And then the question is, how do you put this in the overall structure? And this puts it together, what I talked before about exercise. What we see today in Europe is, on a horizontal level, we have a good communication with the third community and from the exercises with the responsible technical people. If you put it on a vertical layer, the question is, who is the chief information officer of Europe? Who is the IT commissioner, of course you have commissioner Cruz, but you see from the publication of the strategy, others are also involved. If you're going to be a member state, who is responsible? And this is also something which comes in out of the cyber security strategy and the directive in the end. The question, who is the responsible authority in your member state if it is about IT, IT security? Is it one? Is it more? And how do we want it? So if you take this message here, how long did I talk now? Uh, you're all right. You're right. Okay. So if you take this from the strategy, it's really something that we know. If you look into techniques, if you look into third community, we have in every member state on our side. If you look into the communication with exercises, we improved it. We have our standard operational procedure. If it goes into different sectors, we have reached notification only in the area of telecommunication. And the question is, where else do we need it? If it goes about governance, this is a vertical structure. Ask yourself, how is it in your member state, how is it in other member states, and how is it in the European level? And this is what the strategy puts together, that it asks every member state to think about it, to organize it, and put it together. And this in cooperation with other member states who did it already, to have some kind of best practice on the other hand, to discuss it with the Commission that we have this all around perspective on Europe. I want to talk a little bit about which notification and also link it to the discussion of the directive. Um, we have this in the telecommunication sector, as I said, and um, it's something where what we learned from the first report which is only a couple of member states because we are still in the implementation for this. We got last year about 50, 60 um, incidents reporting. And if you talk about cybersecurity, what do you think normally? Oh, it's about training horses, viruses, espionage. But the outcome was that half of these incidents were in the mobile uh, providers and in the 
infrastructure, with the IT infrastructure. So this is something where the question is now, uh, would you have known this without reporting? No. And this is, I think, something where it, it's a message that reporting is a good thing because it gives us information. And as I said before, it's something to help us to increase IT security. If you're now looking to other sectors, you have since the financial crisis a lot of regulation in member states. What is to be done, you have this uh, supervision on a European level with the agency. But if you look into other sectors, you don't have any reporting. And the question is now where to find a balance between information the government needs to make decisions and on the other hand not to put too much burden on the industry because of course it costs money to implement this. But this is when we discuss about the directive that we somehow have to find a compromise and see what is already done in different sectors, where do we need some more, and how do we organize it. <coughs> so, <coughs> this is about uh, the breach notification. We have a similar thing if we talk about the privacy directive. This is about faster data. This is especially the data protection area. And uh, we are also discussing it. I want to make a remark because it fits in this e privacy discussion, in this um, social network discussion, and about uh, <coughs> business models. And I think this is something what you can write in red in your books. Yeah? Today, our personal data is a currency of the internet. And this is a lot of people forget. And if you look from an economic model, you have to pay for everything. You don't get anything for free. And if you go on a social network, if you go on an email service, if you go somewhere where you have your uh, data store, you think you get it for free. But somewhere you pay. And if you look into a lot of business models, these business models depend that they use your personal data, either for profiling, for advertisement. This means they use our profile, and by this you get then specific information or advertisement on the screen. Okay. You can say, give my data, and then I know what the next restaurant is. But it becomes critical if this data is sold, and you cannot do anything. And this comes back, what I said before, to service level agreements. As a normal user, you don't have the chance to change on a social network the terms of condition. Either you press, I agree, or you cannot do it. Yeah? I think this is something where the question behind is, for me something that was a little bit of a philosophical question, does it change our society or not? So, um, I talked a bit about our role there. Um, I think if you look at it, the intention of Anisa is uh, uh, that we want to support you, that uh, we want to give you uh, an added value, that with the service written directive, it's something where we don't want to collect data just for fun, we want really to give back to you that you can make better decisions. Um, if you look about the strategy, there's the last point I want to mention because I think this is something which is also a chance for us in Europe. Um, ENISA is a common market agency. If we talk about Europe, it's the common market idea behind. So, in the end, uh, it's somehow business driven. Uh, I was socialized in the industry before I became a civil servant. So, um, for me, the point is uh, how can we, in the end, use also IT security as a business model? But it's not only a business model for those companies who sell us virus detection or firewall, but also a business model for those who sell smartphones and PCs that they build in IT security or build in privacy by design. And if you look into the strategy, there's an interesting part which talks about standards, which talks about uh, uh, technical guidelines and certification. It talks about uh, so-called European driving license which is the kind of certificate that you know how to deal with IT and IT security. And this is a big chance for the economy. Because if you set standards, and if you are the first who set standards, 
then you can discuss with your industry, and we have good companies and good medium to small companies in here, what they can do. And uh, an example is our electronic passport. It has a chip, it has cryptography, and it's something which was standardized with a European perspective of privacy, data protection, key exchange. And it's something where, if you have now companies who build fingerprint readers, face recognition technology, then you can do export into other areas. So this is something from a European perspective. The Massive is serving a European agency. It's interest that we create jobs also in the IT security area, and with that we have a competitive advantage to the other areas out of Europe. And this is something where if you look into technical guidelines and certification and standardization, it's one instrument which can help in this area. Thank, Thank you very much indeed.